Hello everyone and welcome to this discussion or launch for the new edition of In and Against the State uh, by Pluto Press. Uh, my name's Jamila and I'm going to be chairing this event. Um, I'm really excited to be joined today by John Holloway, who is a lawyer, a Marxian sociologist and philosopher, um, and the author of many books, including Change the World Without Taking Power and Crack Capitalism. He's a member of the London Edinburgh Weekend Return Group, the original authors of the book we're discussing today, In and Against the State. We'll also be joined by Hilary Wainwright, who's the co-editor and co-founder of the magazine Red Pepper. She was assistant chief economics advisor at the Greater London Council, the GLC, from 1982 to 1986, and has written books including Beyond the Fragments, Reclaim the State, Experiments in Popular Democracy, and A New Politics from the Left. And finally, we're joined by Seth Wheeler, who's a writer, researcher, and activist, a co-founder of the workerist journal Notes from Below and the Migrant Solidarity Project Channel Rescue. He's a contributing editor to Occupy Everything and also wrote the introduction to this new edition of In and Against the State. So In and Against the State was first published in 1979, but has been republished this year by Pluto Press with a new introduction written by Seth Wheeler and an exclusive interview with John McDonnell which is very exciting. Um, in the new introduction to the book, Seth's written, I guess, Seth, you identify three different in and against the state tendencies. And I think it's really important that we flesh those out because I think in recent years, since 2015 specifically, in and against has been kind of brought up as uh, a politics that many people hold without maybe fleshing out exactly what, what we mean by that. So for example, I work for the World Transformed. It was a big theme at our 2018 festival. Um, but actually in this book, Seth, you kind of identify three different emerging tendencies. So two of those were in the post-68 libertarian left, the first being the London Edinburgh Weekend Away group, and the second comrades like Hillary, who entered the GLC, um, what both of these tendencies, I think it's fair to say, have in common is a rejection of a Marxist, Leninist, Vanguardism uh, or a top down politics and a commitment to horizontalist politics from below. And Seth, you argue, argue that there was another emergence of that um, in the social movements and events of 2010, but specifically uh, after the election of Jeremy Corbyn as leader of the Labour Party. Um, so the way this event is going to run is we're going to hear about 10 minutes from John, Hillary, and then Seth about the book, why it's important it's republished now. And then we're going to have some time for audience questions. So for anyone with us this evening, there's a Q&A bar. Feel free to type in your questions and I'll be looking out for those and we'll have some time for those at the end. Okay, that's it from me. So I'm going to hand over to John. Uh, could you tell us a bit about why you wrote the book? What questions did you have in mind when you were writing it? And what was the context that you were operating in when the book, when the book was first published? Okay, Thank, thanks very much, Jamila. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, it's the idea, the fact that, that the, it, it's been republished now after 42 years. Is, is just amazing and exciting and many, many thanks to Seth for, for doing it. Um, and one of the exciting things I think is, the, or one of the interesting things is really the way in which its interpretation seems to have changed. Um, we started off, it, I suppose this was about 19, yeah, must have been 78. Um, we started off, or we, in that case, being, I was part, I was in Edinburgh, I was at the university in Edinburgh, and we'd been working on state theory. And Sol Picciotto and I had published a book called State and Capital, which is really about the relation between the state and capital, and argues that the state cannot possibly 
be used to transform society fundamentally because of the depth of the relation between the state, any state, and capital, the way that the state is integrated into the process of capitalist reproduction. <clears throat> so we weren't thinking at all in terms of Labour Party or, or anything like that. But I think the question that then arose for us was, well, we were working for the state. I mean, I was working in a public university. Um, other people involved were working in schools or whatever. So what did that mean for us? How could we think about the fact that we, we were working actively to reproduce a system of destruction? Was there any way in which we could turn our daily activity against the, the, the reproduction of capital? And we came in touch at that time with Cynthia Coburn, who had just written a book called The Local State. And we got in touch with her and her, then met up with her and her friends in London. Um, there was at the time a British Rail um, cheap, off, cheap offer on train tickets, and hence it came to be called the London Edinburgh Weekend Return Group. But I think that was that was really our question, and which is still, I think, for me or for any anybody working in the state or anybody who comes into regular contact with the state or receives a grant from the state or whatever, as as nearly all of us do. How do we think of that involvement in the state in a way that does? that breaks with or tries to break with the reproduction of a system that is probably leading us towards extinction. Now, how do we do that? Um, that's certainly still, still a big, big issue for me. Now, how do I turn my work as a teacher in a public university, how to turn that against capital? That was really what we were trying to, to, to think about. Um, and I suppose the main thing we came to possibly was that it's important to think of the state, not just in terms of what it does, but in terms of how it does, it does things. No? In other words, the state is a system of exclusion. It's a hierarchical system. It's a system through which our discontent is reconciled with the reproduction of capital. How do we break that? We weren't thinking at all, I think, at the time of going into the Labour Party or thinking of using a left party against the state. This is obviously something that has come up in the interpretation or the reinterpretation, rethinking of the idea of in and against the state. Um, and for me, I think it's very interesting to hear about that. Um, I'm not convinced. I mean, my own view is that no, um, a left party, a left government can improve things, but it's still going to be very deeply involved in the reproduction of capitalism. Um, my own, I think as well. Um, so I think that now I wouldn't think in terms of simply in and against the state, but in terms of in against and beyond the state. How do we go beyond the state as a form of political action, as a form of political organization? And for me, that means thinking in terms of the council tradition, the communal, communist, communizing tradition, um, uh, yeah, moving to a completely different type of politics. Um, but I, we have to say, well, I think that none of us has clear answers and that we need to talk about the possibility of going beyond capitalism can only be a question, you know, a desperate, urgent question, but it's a question because we don't have the answers. Um, 
Yeah, that's, I think, hearing just before we, we, we started the session, you were talking about the World Transformed meeting in Brighton. I think one of my big questions, and I was fascinated by Seth's introduction, where he relates the issue of in and against to the post-2011 influx of the left into the Labour Party. I think one of my big questions now would be, well, how do we think of that if we look at that experience in relation to Corbyn, to Sanders, to Tsipras in Greece, to Podemos in, in Spain, then I think we have to say, well, they all failed. All those experiments to kind of turn the state led to failure. And the big question is, well, is this because errors were made, as John McDonald suggests in his interview, or is it is it something structural, simply that that's the wrong way to go, that we have to break with that sort of politics and think of something else? Uh, that's, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, John. And I'm sure there's there's lots of questions in there that we can come back to later, hopefully. Um, but for now, I'm going to pass on to Hillary. And apologies, Hillary, you've, you've posted a correction in the chat, but Beyond the Fragments was co-written by you, Sheila Robottom and Lynn Siegel. Um, and I think that's really important. I, it would be really good to hear about um, your work in the Greater London Council and, and how you you interpreted in, in and against the state politics there, but also a bit about um, the movements that inflected your activism as well as your work there. For example, feminist movements, which Beyond the Fragments is about. Um, okay, and it's lovely to hear John and to um, to probably agree and disagree. Um, <laughs> as always. Um, that, that's what we always have done. Exactly, and it's productive. And, We'll do that in the later bit, but so for this bit, I'll talk not so much about my own opinions, but about the experience of the GLC and and its relationship to in and against the state. And I'll maybe start with feminism because in some ways, as John probably would agree, I mean, because there were several feminists, including Cynthia, involved in the in the London uh, Edinburgh weekend return group, including two who became part of the GLC, Jeanette Mitchell, who sadly died while we were, yeah, while we were at the GLC, and Nicola Murray. <clears throat> and so it was, I mean, not just because of that, but also because we'd all read it and it was constantly referred to. But <clears throat> the importance of feminism and the overlap between feminism and in and against the state is, that, is actually to do with the how that John talks about. So, you know, the fact that the, the, the focus in thinking about the state on the processes of the state, the relationships of the state. So what struck a chord with me in, in, in and against the state was this notion that this distinction between the, the, um, the welfare state, the 45, you know, Atlee government state or the state it created or partially created. Um, and as a, as a, a, in one sense, that was again, progressive, kind of pop I mean, gain for the public because it would involve the redistribution of resources, of public resources um, towards public welfare. But, and it's a big but, the, the relations of administration, the way that public, those public resources were, were organised was extremely, as John said, hierarchical, um, you know, um, exclusive, um, as we later understood, you know, um, oppressive towards women, oppressive towards um, black and ethnic minorities and towards gay people. And, and so we, we, when we came into the GLC, our immediate focus was on relationships, on how the place was managed, uh, how these public resources, and the GLC's resources did involve a considerable redistribution. I mean, you know, it, 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 when it became the Greater London Authority, that was important because it in, involved not just the inner London um, boroughs, which are mainly poor, but also um, Hampstead and the suburbs, which are rich. 
and there was an immediate redistribution of resources. But, you know, the way that it was administered was pretty hierarchical. I mean, it was it was literally, in, you know, like a, an army. I mean, we were called officers, you know, and very, very graded. So I wasn't a chief officer, but I was a senior officer. And the building was was itself, in a way, morally hierarchical. So the first floor was for councillors alone and chief officers. So even my first day, I would kind of like, I'm a nosy creature, so I would wander up to the first floor, you know, maybe to see our councillor or just to sniff out what was happening. And somebody would officially, officiously uh, confront me and say, are you a chief officer? No. Well, you can't come up here, you know. So, so I had to kind of, well, I said, well, you know, my chief officer knows I'm here. It's fine. But no, I had to, I can't remember what happened exactly, but, but we changed, we did, we, I mean, this isn't a kind of great argument for, for the revolutionary possibilities, but we did, you know, we were confronting those sort of relationships all the time. And we did attempt to, to change them. And to a degree we did, I mean, it, I helped to create a, a part of the economic, we were in economic policy and we created this unit called the popular planning unit rather optimistically um, and indeed one of our colleagues you know we'd always answer the phone saying hi there this is the popular planning unit sounding as if popular planning could be just sort of conjured out of a hat like a, ra a, a rabbit but but he would he just got a bit fed up with this and he said he, he's going to start answering the phone saying hello, this is the miserable planning unit. Anyway, so this was the sort of optimism that we started with. Um, but we, try, we tried to organise this popular planning unit as a, as a horizontal group. I mean, we had Sheila Robotham and other um, feminists and men influenced by feminism. So we, we, we kind of made it a collective, but we were working within this hierarchical institution. The salaries were very hierarchical. And it would be it was impossible to redistribute those salaries. You know, there was a kind of implicit hierarchy because if we wanted to get, um, you know, like the agreement of the finance people in the main bureaucracy, then either I or the chief officer, a, a friend of both John's and mine called Robin Murray, we had to negotiate with the the, you know, the top guys in finance or in the legal um, department. So the, there was an inbuilt hierarchy that even, you know, the, these strong libertarians couldn't confront. And anyway, but I think the other thing that we did that I feel we did achieve some things in terms of um, redistributing those resources and changing relations. So the way we did it was was important because it presumed a very strong autonomous movement outside and independent and beyond the, the GLC. And that was important. I mean, we too were beyond in the sense that we, that nobody asked us to join the Labour Party and we didn't. I mean, I didn't join the Labour Party, nor well, Sheila maybe had, but it didn't matter. Nobody asked for our party card. We weren't, we were, we were political appointees, but not in party terms, but because we came from social movements. And so we, the ways in which we changed the relationships was not only internal, you know, trying to break down the hierarchies, but we, um, we delegated resources to the social movements in London and not just resources, but also a platform. So in a way, we tried to break up the state. And I agree very much with John's notion, description of the problem, which is how do we break, how do we break the... Um, the, the ways in which the state acts as a means of reproduction. So, for example, childcare, we didn't, we were, we'd all come from a women's movement which had been highly critical of the, um, the patriarchal, the, 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 the gendered nature of the delivery of services like childcare through the welfare state. Um, and the women's movement had already begun its own self-organized cooperative um, forms of organization of childcare. And so what we did was to um, map out these and talk to 
the, the women involved and the groups involved and bring them together so that we had through them or they had an overview of what was happening. We didn't rely on the state for that overview. Aren't we in a way developed an underview, what we called an underview. So we and then we we developed a strategy with them for the, the state, the GLC to fund those groups. So in a way we were we were supporting the autonomy and we were quite conscious about how important it was that we didn't take over those groups or the GLC didn't didn't take over those groups as it had criteria which was to do with uh, exclusion you know to do with race and, and 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 so on but but that we didn't actually sort of micromanage those groups they retained their autonomy including their autonomy to say fuck off to the GLC you know if it was if it was intruding in any way so i think that was important that we did manage a certain um you know change in relationships that involved supporting the struggles of people including also workers in multinationals and so on outside the GLC but finally Jamila because I, I don't want to take up too much time you know in the end we did come up against the state you know Thatcher and the fact that um the, and the fact of neoliberalism and neoliberalism wasn't just this sort of idea that came out of the ether and some sort of you know, ghost of Hayek or something. It was it was a definite um, kind of class reaction to the um, growing power of workers' organisations um, in 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 production, particularly in the car industry, and also to the growing assertion of um, public need, social need through the expansion of social movements demanding you know, increased, um, you know, childcare provision. In a way, social movements were a demand on the state. And in a sense, the, the, the Thatcher, who was very close to the city um, and to corporate and financial capital, financial capital particularly, wanted an end to this. So that in a way, we were in and against the state in the context of um, the GLC. But in a way, we were we were we we recognised and we learned how powerful the national state is, particularly in Britain, an imperial state, you know, a state that's dominated by um, the the notion of parliamentary sovereignty rather than popular sovereignty. I mean, because in the end, the, the and this also has an electoral system that pushes everything to the centre. Because we didn't even get the well, not even we didn't get the support of Neil Kinnock and the Labour Party, who who actually treated us as absolutely you know toxic so we we were both up and up against um thatcher but also against the labor party so the whole national state so in that sense we had to be beyond the state and in a sense livingston himself um in, ended up beyond the state in the sense of um being expelled from the labor party and only winning the mayorship later by being um against and also in a certain sense beyond the the political establishment so i'll end there and carry on the discussion with john and seth later brilliant thanks hillary and i think that that takes us to an interesting closing point because yeah as you say throughout that time even to the labor party you were marginalized and and not felt to be welcome and i guess there was a there was a blip in history in 2015, where that stopped being the case, where, or arguably it stopped being the case, where we elected Jeremy Corbyn to be the leader of the Labour Party, which is where Seth argues that there is a third emergence of an in and against state politics. And Seth, I wonder if you could talk us through that a little bit and where you saw this, what it was in this movement that you saw this tendency re-emerging. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, and also thank you for Housemans for, for hosting this. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's kind of funny. So if we come to 2015, I think what we have is basically, I mean, history ob obviously never repeats itself. However, it does often have a sort of tendency to rhyme. And I think um, to, to, to get to the question of 2015 and why, why I think this politics emerges yet again, 
I think we have to maybe go back and talk about the period that John and Hillary came out of, um, just to sort of back end some of that sort of like some of the politics or some of the methodologies of politics that then later get incorporated into sort of the wider social movement left as they move towards the Labour Party. So I think it's, it's fair enough to say that both John and Hillary are a sort of product of a sort of post-68 political imaginary, uh, particularly in the European context. Uh, and if you're a revolutionary socialist at that period, um, uh, you know, the Soviet Union had proven itself to be in a sort of authoritarian regime that, you know, that the, what had happened in Hungary in 1956, you know, Khrushchev's secret speech had sort of like unraveled the sort of mythology that socialists had in relationship to the sort of Marxist project or the Marxist-Leninist project in, in the Soviet Union. And a lot of socialists in, across Europe and across the world were looking for new forms of socialism um, that, you know, were, were led by workers, didn't have this sort of like necessarily a command economy aspect to them, weren't authoritative, disciplinarian, etc. Um, and I think all those politics basically imbued both Hillary's experiments uh, and the social movements that Hillary came out of and then through that went into the GLC, but also informed uh, the, what was what the Edinburgh London Return Weekend Away group were trying to, to trying to write. Now I'm not arguing that they have the same conclusions, but they definitely have the same impetus, which is like a rejection. I would argue a sort of Marxist-Leninist vanguardism. Uh, an interest in sort of like workers' inquiry, or I suppose particularly in in and against not only workers' inquiry as a way of sort of working out politics and working out how workers can take control of their own industry, but also I suppose like a, a service user inquiry as well, like how could we incorporate people who rely on public service structures, you know, to to maybe think through collectively how we can. I, know, I don't know. I mean, uh, how we can both defend these institutions from further hollowing out. So like, we recognise that the NHS and the benefit system and all these things are qualitative goods under capital for the working class. We need to defend these so you know, they can't be hollowed out further by successive governments. But at the same time, we recognise that these things have a disciplinary power, right? They reproduce and maintain us as workers inside capital. And I think that was one of the things that actually I'm quite critical, I suppose, of that sort of experiment with the GLC is not necessarily the impetus and the politics of the comrades who went into that. But I think because they were unable to form themselves as a sort of like cadre with a shared politics, they were also then unable to talk about those politics in those languages, in the languages of autonomy, their experiments with the state and, and what they were attempting to do there. And, and they came up against, I suppose, more entrenched socialist traditions, uh, which may have a sort of different comprehension of socialism, i.e. it's something from above. It's maybe about a command economy. It's maybe about just regulating work in a better, more fairly remunerated way or whatever. And I think that was one of those, and I think that was one of the big problems in, in, that, in that wave of in and against activity. And then... So when we get to 2010, there's obviously 2010, 2015, there are like two events that come very quickly after each other. We've got obviously the global financial crisis of 2008, and you see an emergence uh, across the globe of sort of like extra parliamentary activity, um, particularly, I suppose, uh, the, most, the most notable examples in that period being, I suppose, like the global Occupy movement or the movement of the squares where, you know, pan pan-continentally, lots of people are coming together and experimenting with new forms of democratic procedure, using consensus, um, in, you know, occupying city squares to talk through politics and, and what people were going to do uh, in order to, like, put their lives right. And I think it's fair enough to say that you can use those sort of methodologies to maybe organise life at the level of the square, but, um, but it became very apparent, uh, particularly when you were under attack from the state, that these methodologies may not be appropriate necessarily for like taking control of a of a you know post-industrial capitalist society or something. And in those countries where you do have more open democratic systems, 
you do see the emergence of, I suppose, what we would call like social movement parties. So things like Podemos or whatever. And these are part of what is now being defined as the sort of institutional turn where you see social movement actors moving towards the development of maybe a new form of like political party that's led from below that list you know it's involved in the delegation models that the glc when hillary is involved in we're trying to like work through um however i would argue that you know obviously what you see particularly in the british context you see um around that period just after occupy you you get this blip where loads of people rush to join the green party the green surge um, I suppose because the Green Party was seen to represent the social movement's aspirations for like more democratic procedures, policy led from below, etc. And then obviously you get this moment where, you know, out of, out of history or somehow out of space, Jeremy is on a ballot and then everyone leaves that project and rushes back into this old legacy Labour institution. And I do think that that was the sort of like political, that, that sort of politics was relatively hegemonic and cast a shadow over a lot of young people joining the party at that period. Um, however, I think it was unable yet again to organize itself into an organized tendency with its own politics, with, uh, with a very different sort of comprehension of what the state is and how we can bypass it. Um, so I think, yeah, I, like John, I sort of wonder whether the question is actually structural or whether, you know, as John, or as John McDonald says, you know, it's just like, you know, a series of opportunities that were, that were dropped. I mean, obviously I don't, you know, to paraphrase Marx, I don't think that humanity makes its own history and conditions of its own choosing. Uh, so I don't think we can like have this purist thing where we stay outside of these debates and don't engage with them or try and experiment. But I do wonder what the limit is of us continuing to try and bash our heads through the Labour Party at the moment, but you know, at the same time, there have been lots of benefits that have been made for quote unquote the left under Corbynism. So that's kind of this double helix. Anyway, I hope that was clear. Thanks, Seth. Um, I think it might actually be interesting now we've gone full circle to go back to John. And John, if you have a, a response to this argument that that the Corbyn project was in many ways in, in an against the state project. Um, if you think that was the case, but also now with that project being over, what you see as the future for, for an in and against tenancy. Um, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I think I don't have any clear answers. Um, it was lovely to hear about the hear Hillary talking about the GLC, which seems to me, and also reading John McDonald's interview about that. It's really it seems to me a really interesting experiment. That yeah, I mean, one of the impress most impressive elements is what Hillary um, mentioned about the promoting autonomous groups and you know by and not just you know. But yeah, in the end, it came up against the state, not just against that, I would say not just against neoliberalism, it came up against capitalism and the capitalist state and crashed. You no, know? it was worth, I would say, thinking about it from here, that it was worth doing. And I remember we were in contact, we in Edinburgh were in contact with it through, uh, of course, through the London end, through Jeanette and Nicola, and, and Cynthia as well, less directly, but, um, you know, so I think for me thinking of the GLC, that seems to me, I think of it as a really interesting experiment. What Seth says, I mean, I mean, I think that the, the <coughs> I may be thinking of it from here, I mean, I also feel that politics has moved on, that left politics has moved on since then, that since the 80s, we've had the huge rise of autonomous movements. We've had um, the huge rise of anti-statist or, uh, yeah, and beyond state um, thinking about revolution or about rebellion and how that is organized and how that can advance. We have obviously 
the case of the Zapatistas, we have the um, the case of the, the Kurdish movement and yeah, uh, that takes us beyond all that kind of left discussion of whether we should be in a left party or not. And I would say that we really have to think in those terms. We have to think, you know, the, the left party thing has just never worked. <laughs> I mean, I understand that. I understand the attraction of, of Corbyn. I understand the attraction of, yes, Podemos in its time of, um, uh, of, of um, what's it called in Greece, etc. I mean, I think that there is, I've been mean, thinking as well of the world transformed meetings, which I really know very little about. I mean, I can see there's a kind of, this must be a kind of desperation, especially among young people, you know, who are being so hard hit at the moment by capitalism. It seems to me if, if you look at, at what people, especially young people, are, are living through, um, with the, the, the whole pandemic and what's coming out of it and the whole, uh, yeah, what's been happening over the last 10 years, there must be this sort of desperation or rec recognition at least that the system just is not working. And then there's the question, well, what do we do? Where do we go? Where do we go? And I think that, yeah, a Corbynite, or a left Labour Party, or a Sandersite um, Democratic Party in, in, in the States kind of says, well, come here, this is your hope. And it just doesn't work. I mean, I think we have to say, look, we've, it, it doesn't work. So where else do you go? And I think where else do you go has to be a kind of rethinking of what politics means, a rethinking in terms of um, autonomous organization in terms of communal organization in terms of commons in terms of um, breaking with the separation between the political and the economic um, it has to be i mean you know the zapatistas are on this absolutely insanely beautiful um, invasion of Europe at the moment. It has to kind of take up these creative, surrealistic, working at another sort of politics. I mean, I think that has to be the only way forward, um, that you have to say, well, no to the left parties, no. Very understandable, but it really has not worked. No, um, yeah, I think that's that. That's my feeling. Hilary, I can see you're you're desperate to respond to John, so please do go ahead. <laughs> well, we've had a lot of debates, so I won't repeat them. But I mean, I I will say several things that, by way of sort of clarification, which is that absolutely it is a structural problem, and that maybe I don't agree with John McDonnell there, but absolutely it is, and I'll come back to the structural problem in Britain. And there's a different, I mean, the structural problems are, are both similar in terms of relations to capital, but also distinct in terms of different political histories in, in, in Britain, Spain, Italy, uh, I mean, uh, Greece and Italy. But I think also I'd say it's not about only. I mean, I honestly think that one of the most important things about the Corbyn project and why you can see the energy that you do in the world transformed. It, it, it was absolutely not about, you know, going to the Labour Party. It wasn't, so it wasn't about, you know, a, what's our home, come here. In a way, the, the, the Corbyn project was about, we want to go to you. So Corbyn, well, Corbyn himself was very clear. He would, I remember at Murray's speeches, he would say, look, if there's a hospital closure, don't come to me, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm, it's not an MP, it's not the parliament that's gonna solve that problem. It, we need to support you. And that was the logic of the GLC. So absolutely the priority is building that power, that what I call transformative power 
which is in a way that's what I learned from the women's movement that the, the, the driving force of social change of social transformation comes from um, society comes from the workers on whom capital depends um, and the communities the women on whom capital depends so unless there's self-organization and um, movements for transformation and control coming from society from from the working class in a very broad sense then there will be no change and so <clears throat> it's building that transformative power which is the crucial thing but the, the the state under certain conditions can be a resource for that transformative power so that in the women's movement in the end for example we we built our nurseries and our rape crisis centers but we we believe we wanted some share of those public resources so we we built some kind of um movement that was based on the transformative power of our our self-organization but then attempted to get public resources from the from the local authority and so on and in a way if you look at jeremy corbyn and john's program it, it was it was less about what the state will do i i would be a little bit critical of it i think probably john and jeremy you know though they many ways broke from a traditional laborism and statism they didn't break sufficiently and in the end electorally they they remained vulnerable to that sort of shift to the center and you know i do think there is a big structural problem with the british state which you know i don't feel the corbyn project addressed which which imprisoned it as it's imprisoned all labor lefts historically which is that the, the the british state is based on parliamentary sovereignty the mps make their oath to the crown in parliament which is basically the state and so their allegiance is to the state uh, not to the people and in a way corbyn in practice in his daily practice uh, was actually accountable to the people but the pressure on him was to be accountable to the state and this was reflected in the in the electoral pressures on him to um to constantly um in a way not move to the center in terms of policy but in terms of method you know even when he didn't sing the bloody um, um you know national anthem or whatever it is he was like kind of attacked and attacked and attacked. so if he'd said look we're going to actually abolish the any constitutional role for the monarchy in the way that tony ben he did once sign a a bill by tony ben to abolish the monarchy um and he he supported it but if he'd carried on in that vein and linked it to the structural problem that any real transformation would have faced you know he would have been well in a way he was treated as a threat to the state which he absolutely was and therefore my conclusion from that is that you know you cannot challenge the state which you do if you're the kind of left party that jeremy was trying to build unless you build if you put your priority on actually building that popular movement and you know though john called for that popular movement john mcdonald he um in a way he, he momentum and so much of the um the sort of emphasis of the 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 movement around corbyn was not on building that movement which is very building that movement is very difficult and time consuming and you often have to say well i'm not going to go to that labor party meeting because actually i'm actually working with people in in a hospital fighting privatization and that's my priority but i so i'm 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 saying that we we need to prioritize that transformative power from below because we are up against a structural problem but that what well, we've got to think not about the only route but we can combine we, our, our strategy can be it can be complex and hybrid and as long as we understand where the priority lies and we we don't get sucked into the electoralism i mean i'm still in the labor party but you know i know very clear where my priority is and if staying in it becomes a conflict i will i will not i will leave and and put you know and, but i mean that that it isn't necessarily a conflict um as long as you are rooted in those struggles so um that's kind of 
agreeing with John about structural problem, agreeing with the importance of the transformative politics of building from below, but not, in, not agreeing with that, the idea that that excludes any engagement, sort of pragmatic, cool, uncommitted engagement with, um, with electoral politics. Thanks, Hilary. Uh, do you want to respond to this, Seth? Yeah, I mean, I suppose that idea of, you know, operating inside the shadow of the party as a mechanism to like build, you know, for one of a word, build, build a social movement and, and utilise the party structures or whatever, that was always one of the big promises of Corbynism. And it definitely haunted the imagination of that project. But I think, you know, the reality was, as, as you correctly identify, Hillary, that just didn't happen. And I think you know, the, the much lauded momentum as the sort of social movement architecture that was like, you know, way to the left of the leadership. Although lots of people I did meet in that project were way to the left of the leadership in terms of politics and what they imagined, you know, and, uh, and, and the sort of militant anti-capitalism as opposed to a sort of like social democratic management of the state or whatever. That, that there didn't seem to be any emphasis placed on actually building that social movement outside of like, crude electoralism so like momentum could get people out in the streets to knock on doors uh but it just didn't seem to be able to contain those people to do both that activity and get involved in sort of you know community or workplace struggle and i think that's still like a big question mark as as we move forward so for example when we went to the world transformed you know obviously there were it was the first time that lots of young socialists and people got together in the last two years, right? You know, it's been COVID, people came together, were very excited, energized and whatever. But, you know, it's very hard to, to, to view that then, to, to view that event and, you know, separate the woods from the trees when it's sort of like, well, why did people come? Are they interested still in the Labour Party? Are they interested in playing this sort of long game through the CLPs? Um, if so, fair play to them. It's not a game I want to play. Uh, but where is the space for those of us who want to maybe be involved in community organising, workplace organising, that has a more sort of like, quote unquote, autonomous focus? And how do we also communicate and coordinate with those comrades who are still in the party? And I think that's what we've been lacking this whole time, is like a, a space to come together, a non-partisan space to democratically debate strategy and to move that project forwards. And I think until we can put that in place, I fear that the, the party may end up just being a machine to produce status, i.e. we can't leave because of the gains that the left have made in the last five years, but also at the same time, we can't do anything with it because we don't have a sympathetic leadership to enact the radical policy or ideas that are being generated from below. And at what point does that rupture? I don't know, but I think what we do need is to create this sort of democratic space because that's the only way we're going to have these social movements that could either take the gamble on an in against politics or alternately just go their own way. And I still don't think we have that either at the moment. Don't you think the World Transform is beginning to create that space? I mean, I felt I was in that space when I was, um, was in Brighton. I, I didn't feel... Um, and I, I, I don't feel in Hackney either, a, a great sort of pull towards the Labour Party. Nobody's pulling me. I mean, here in Hackney, the momentum is very much about, about social movements, supporting the Deliveroo drivers, supporting the different sort of um, unions that are organising precarious workers, supporting, you know, all my, my um, WhatsApp um, groups are about, you know, fighting the... For the, for the insourcing of cleaning in the hospital, in, in Homerton Hospital, fighting against the sacking of um, a teacher in a, in a, in a private a school that's, that's been become an academy. I mean, I, I think that, I mean, I agree with you, we need that space, but let's work with the spaces that exist and put and, and think a bit beyond them and, and strengthen them and, um, I mean, the media, left media like Red Pepper and Navara and and so on, I, I think they're similarly, um, I mean, certainly Red Pepper, it's only one I can speak for, but I think looking at Navara, it would be true of them, that we, I mean, Red Pepper is mainly about giving a platform to to social struggles and to helping them connect with each other through 
through recognizing them and giving them a form of representation. I mean, you could say that now political representation is a bit of a dead end with a few exceptions. And there are those important young, uh, mainly young um, left MPs that do give it genuine representation without asking people to join the Labour Party. But I think the media, the left media can be another form of representation that that supports and 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 legitimates and encourages um, the kind of transformative grassroots organization and capacity building that John is talking about. And I think, you know, where John is absolutely right in in most of his books like Crack Capitalism is the emphasis not just on mobilization, you know, in the streets and so on, but actually in creating actual alternatives, you know, so challenging the the actual reproduction of capital. So, you know, what's happened in the Latin village, which is, John, a part of London that was about to be taken over by a big property developer and local market holders and communities organised, you know, to resist it. And the local council initially didn't support them, but after a long struggle has given them some support. But they, their mood, judging from the meeting at the uh, world transformed is absolutely to continue to organize autonomously not to rely on the council but those things are happening and i think it's important that the twt and the red pepper and so on and any any other kind of movement that we can envisage gives those movements their you know support and a platform and a means of developing their strategy and their strength Go for it, John. I just think something pretty quick because I know you want to move on. Um, it just, yeah, I mean, I understand this about combining the two different approaches. And I think, yes, to some extent, I agree. But I think you have to say, okay, we must, if we want to combine them, we have to start from the contradiction between them. No, Hillary mentioned the importance of self organization. No, crucial. But then we have to say, well, the state is the negation of self-organization. That's what the state is. We get involved in state politics or state party politics. Then we have to be aware all the time of that contradiction and yeah. think how we do it. No? That's, so I put the, say, okay, combine if you like, but that contradiction and awareness and analysis of that contradiction has to be in the centre. Yes, I, I agree with that, actually. Mm. Mm. Well, we've, we've got a question um, in the chat, uh, which quite a few people will be interested to hear from you all on, which is, how do you think that the new mu municipalism, like Barcelona on Camus or co co sorry, Cooperation Jackson, do you think that they exemplify a model of in and against the state? And if so, how? And if not, why not? Seth. Sorry, neither do actually. Um, I think Barcelona Comu were, you know, like, again, it has multiple origin points, very similar to like most organizations. Um, it does have an origin in the sort of autonomous social movements that emerged in response to the, the financial crisis in 2010. Um, but it also had residual relationships to uh, the socialist parties there and whatever, and local councils and whatever. Um, also, Corporation Town Jackson basically comes out of um, sort of community organizing in uh, predominantly in the black community in America, but also like is very heavily inflicted, inflected by a sort of anarchist, anarchist politics, which I would argue would firmly be in rejection of the state in its totality, even at the municipal level, it would be much more interested in people coming together, thinking through different ways of living, being, cooperating, et cetera, that don't necessarily reproduce capital or the state. Um, I do think, you know, like to, to, to give maybe to maybe speak a bit more about Barcelona Comu. I mean, they, they obviously do have a sort of in and against model. They obviously do think that they can utilize resources from the state to empower social movements. They, you know, like they, they are handing over huge amounts of sort of like state infrastructure and money and time and energy, a bit like the GLC 
to helping to develop policy that's led from below. Um, but again, as, as John has already already iterated, you know, we, we often come up against the actual question of the state itself, um, which, you know, I mean, even if we look at like what happened in the UK with Corbyn, right, we had loads of councillors who were elected on a Corbynite ticket, all very, very good principled comrades until we get to the point where, you know, they come up against the reality of the budgets that are coming down from central government. And it's like, well, actually, yeah, I'm going to have to close that library, you know. And if we had a social movement that was worth its salt, what we would have done is gone down to those councils and said, you're part of our movement. You're not actually our representative. Get the fuck out. Or we would have, like, created our own or attempted to have our own assemblies or done something. But we didn't because we were so concerned about upsetting the electoral chances of Jeremy that we never went through that. And that's why I actually think at the end of the day, Jeremy's radical offer, you know, fell on the deaf, fell on deaf ears when it came to, you know, the vast majority of the working class. So I think if it had, had if it had actually stuck to its radical potential, rather than constantly sort of attempting to moderate itself and keeping this contradiction between state power and extra parliamentary power, I think maybe something would have been slightly different. Yeah, can I add to that? I mean, I think I'd answer it slightly differently. I mean, I'd say that those two cases, which I know a bit about, but I don't know them in depth, are kind of living or working within exactly that contradiction that John outlined between the state as, you know, an instrument of capital. I mean, the national state and the local state being maybe more contested, but still, you know, um, structured um, in a way that that makes it naturally an ally of capital but but you know that the, in in um, Barcelona they have made various ruptures I mean as a result of strong social movements with Barcelona as the sort of um, as the showpiece and the kind of um, um, vehicle for multinational capital vis-a-vis mobile phones, Airbnb, um, Uber, and so on. So there, there's a constant, uh, there's a constant struggle there. There is, and, and I suppose for me, the criteria is, is the leadership of Barcelona on Camus aware? Is it self-conscious about working within and against that contradiction? You know, is it, is it, a, is, is, is that how it sees its role? And I, I just don't know. I mean, certainly at a, Kalau, who came from a very strong social movement, very autonomous, very militant against evictions, would probably, you know, accept that, you know, that that contradiction that, or the description of that contradiction. But whether or not it's found a way of of building social movements, and here I would distinguish it very much from Podemos, because Podemos, in the end, never really a bit like, you could say a little bit like Momentum, it never, and, and, and Corbyn, it never actually put into practice its um, rhetoric and commitment to building um, local social movements. So its circles, the Podemos circles, were sort of effectively disbanded in the, in the build-up to the election. Um, and, and in a way, Barcelona on Camus, to give it its due, has persisted in its support for social movements. Um, similarly, from listening to the lead, the leadership of um, uh, Corporation Jackson, I, I feel that the, the leadership there, um, um, Kalia Kuna, have I got the name right? He, he's got quite a sharp understanding of that contradiction and has got no, no faith in the state. Uh, and it puts his emphasis on, on building popular movements, particularly amongst um, black residents. So I think I'd be a bit more positive, but but on the condition that that contradiction is at the heart of their work and they recognise it. And similarly now, with Momentum and world, The World Transformed, I mean, I get the feeling that the new leadership of Momentum, in a way, has come from a recognition of the failures of Momentum under Corbyn and is trying to deal with that contradiction you know i mean how how effectively i mean i'm not in a position to say but 
but I think that's its trajectory. And similarly, the world transformed, I feel, is as learning lessons and in a way with its emphasis on political education and political education as tied to struggle. It's trying to address that problem of how do you build a, an autonomous and powerful social movement. I think perhaps there's a question of time here. I sometimes feel that, yeah, that, okay, these local municipal um, socialist experiments can make sense, but only if they're understood in terms of quick raids. Now you can go, perhaps win control of a council, think, oh, well, we do go all out to do what we really believe in, we're probably not going to last more than three or six months before we're shut down, but let's go all out for that. But don't think in terms of permanence. No. I remember with the GLC, and we've already mentioned Jeanette Mitchell, who is both in the crucial in the London Edinburgh Weekend Return Group and working in the GLC. And I remember her saying that, well, once the... GLC began to build up its campaign to defend itself from Thatcher's attack, then it was really, it was finished. The defense won't work. Defense takes us into the logic of the system, but there may well be a case for going in, you know, with, for really pushing for change and assuming that you're going to be thrown out because you really are going to clash with the logic of the system. Yeah, I mean, I think that's there's a point in that, but I would say that a lot depends on a recognition of your allies. So in the case of the GLC, it was the last days of the GLC were occurring during the miners' strike. And so in, in, in the same time as the fight against abolition, we were involved with the support for the miners. And for example, in the popular planning unit, all our time was spent supporting the miners. I mean, we, we recognized abolition was coming, so there wasn't much point doing our normal work. So we just organized support for the miners, you know, organized for the women in the mining communities to come down, to, to, be, to be supported by Livingston for, um, you know, the, the gay groups supporting the miners to be based at the GLC. So um, it was, it, 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 I think, crucial to that building of a, an, a powerful movement is, is recognising allies, not just working on your own struggle. And I think, I think the GLC in its latter days, you know, did, it did do that. It, you know, its support for the miners was absolutely all out. And that's another thing that, led to it being opposed by Ken Livings, uh, by um, Neil Kinnock and, and so on. Um, but I can see Jeanette's, uh, you know, um, identifying of a dangerous logic that could have been involved in simply defending it. Thanks a lot, Hilary. I'm very sorry to cut off this, what feels like a very fruitful conversation. Um, we are running slightly over time, so I'd like to suggest that we wrap up now, but I think it's it's really important that these conversations keep going. Um, before we do, I'm going to pass over to Seth. Would you like to tell people where they can get your book from? The book, sorry. Our book, our book. <laughs> Everyone's book. Our book. So you can obviously get it from the Pluto website um, and Houseman's and all sort of good radical bookshops. If you must buy it from Amazon, then make sure you donate to a decent sympathetic strike funds or, uh, and you can probably steal it from most sort of Waterstones or something. Uh, there are um, PDF copies of the original, um, which are available online, where if you want to, if you know where to look. Um, and yeah, the John is holding up. And also I think the Mayday Rooms in London have copies of that in their archive uh, alongside some other stuff. So that's probably worth looking at. Uh, oh, sorry, steal from Waterstone. Someone said not Houseman's, that's correct. Uh, don't steal from Houseman's, that's, that's not comradely. Uh, so uh, I'd also like to say that um, Jamira and I were talking earlier about maybe continuing 
this conversation um, with with both with both of you, maybe with the world transformed in the in the coming weeks, because I think there's still some stuff that needs to be articulated and worked through. And I'm very keen to keep the correspondence and the conversation going because it's an incredibly important discussion. I think. Anyway, thank you very much, and thank you to Houseman's and Jamila and everybody for turning up. And sorry, we can't answer all the questions. I was just emailing somebody who's an anonymous attendee saying, telling him or her my email uh, and saying I'd answer it. One of them was about my my experience in the Young Liberals. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that's uh, something I can answer him. And also about the importance of the digital, the digital sort of sphere. Again, um, so I'm just, so my email is wainwright.hillary at gmail.com. And I'm happy to answer any questions then with that. Great. Thank you, Hilary. Um, it's great you're up for answering questions because I know some were unanswered. And yeah, like I say, we'd love to continue this conversation. Um, John, were there any closing remarks you wanted to make before we wrap up? Yeah, just really to say what an enormous pleasure it is. Really a delight. I mean, here I am sitting in near in Puebla in Mexico no? and connecting with this pamphlet that we wrote 42 years ago, connecting with, with you, Jamila, with Hillary, discussions we've had over many years, and with Seth, who's really got this all together. And for me, a delight, a real pleasure, and I would be very, very happy to continue the, the conversation. Yes, no, I'd echo that. It's absolutely wonderful to see, to, to continue our discussion with John. And to, um, and I just want to really endorse that support for Seth in doing all this. I mean, you know, because it took a lot of work, I presume, organising the republication, mm. writing that really interesting introduction. Um, and, and to um, Jamila and TWT for, for organising this. And I hope continuing the discussion. And maybe, and I think it would be good to get John you know, um, uh, and other, you know, maybe maybe moment, people like Deborah from Momentum involved. Yes, definitely to be continued. Um, thank you, everyone. And thanks so much to Houseman's for hosting us. Uh, just to reiterate, if you can, if you want to buy the book, buy it from Houseman's or another independent bookshop. If you can't get it from an independent bookshop or radical bookshop, then steal it from Waterstones, as Seth said. Um, and also buy Red Pepper from Houseman's as well. Awesome. Also buy Red Pepper from Houseman's. Great shout. Thanks so much, everyone. And yeah, I hope we get to chat again soon. It's a real pleasure. Definitely.